the individual when he's running on the treadmill, he's thinking about all the general good he's doing, all the children that he's saving, potentially, and this general sense of warm glow would be more effective in uh, motivating him to lose weight and to keep working out than what the five dollars was given directly to them. But what if instead of five dollars per pound lost, it was a hundred dollars per pound lost? Well, now a hundred dollars is a lot of money. So now when he's running on the treadmill, he's not thinking about that treat he can buy himself, but more uh, the, the TV he's going to buy himself or the vacation that he's able to take. So now that is a, a lot of motivation. So $100 given to the individual may be more effective uh, than the $100 going to the Make-A-Wish Foundation because in general, the thought process and the psychology of the $100 uh, going to the Make-A-Wish Foundation is relatively the same as far as motivation. So what's the uh, theoretical sort of story behind this? So I draw largely on this concept of warm glow that Kim had suggested earlier, that individuals derive pleasure and utility uh, from charitable behavior, not from the outcome for the people that they're working for, the outcome for others, but from the act itself. So I view myself as a good person because I'm donating money or I'm work donating time, but the actual output for others, the efficiency of my time and money, matters significantly less. So hence, donating, uh, if, I, if I put in a amount of effort, it doesn't really matter for me how much output that has, how much effect that has on other people, I just care about the fact that I'm putting in a certain amount of effort. So you can think of individuals being relatively insensitive to the amount of money that's going to the charity based on their unit of effort. So they'll work uh, a certain amount when a little bit goes to charity or when a lot goes to charity. That's not going to change much. But as we've shown, we've seen a lot in economics and standard theory would suggest that individuals are definitely, definitely care about how much they're getting paid. So if they're not getting paid a lot, they don't work very much. When they're getting paid a lot, they increase how much they work. So the idea is that pro-social incentives are good. They motivate better and standard incentives, but to a point, particularly when the stakes are low, people work harder for charity than they work for themselves. But as you increase the stakes, they don't change how much they work for charity, but they definitely change how much they work for themselves. So you get this flip over point, such that when you increase the stakes high enough, the standard incentive scheme is best. So now I'd like to go over how exactly I tested this in the lab. If you're interested in the paper and the details, it's uh, Please contact me. But in general, here's, here's how the standard sort of lab experiment works. So students, again, this is the, the, a very typical lab experiment, were recruited to come into the lab. They got a $5 short fee. And they were asked to squeeze this hand dynamometer. So this hand dynamometer, it's this uh, machine, uh, machine looking thing that measures your force output in newtons. So basically it measures exactly how much effort you're putting in at every second. So that's how much uh, we took that as a measure of effort. So, um, and we measured this effort over a 60 second interval. So it was measured in two stages. So a person came in, they were told, look, sit down, we'd like to calibrate this machine, please squeeze it as hard as you can. They squeezed it as hard as they could for 60 seconds, and then we introduced the treatment. And the treatment was either a low incentive or a high incentive per amount of uh, effort that they put in. The effort was 25,000 newtons. They knew what that meant. And then either the money went to them at the end of the experiment or that money was donated to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And what we use this our dependent variable is the ratio between how much effort they put in after they learned about the treatment and the baseline measure. And this allowed us to control for a bunch of things such as gender differences, uh, levels of, of strength, and so forth. So the hypothesis here, in order to test uh, this theory that we have, is that at the low incentives, when you don't have a lot of money to spend as a firm, indeed the pro-social incentive is going to be superior to the standard one. People are going to be working harder for the Make-A-Wish Foundation than they would for themselves. But as you increase the incentive, they don't work harder for the charity, but they work harder for themselves. And that's in fact what we found. Here's the graph of the data. On the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, you have the incentive level. And then the effort in terms of a ratio is on the y-axis. As you can see, at the low incentive level, they worked a lot harder for others than they did for themselves. So if I don't have a lot of money to spend, use this pro-social incentive scheme, it works great, people are working harder. The charities are making money, the firm is getting a better output, and the individual is feeling pretty happy. But as you increase the amount, 
that, that's either going to the charity or to the individual, they don't really, they, they don't uh, change how much they work. So with the high incentive, the charity is making a lot more money for the same unit of effort, but the individuals aren't responding at all, and that's support for the warm world model of giving. But they care a lot when the money is going to them. So they increase how much they work, and hence, they're at the high incentive level, the pro-social incentive <coughs> is no longer the superior. So, Here's just a summary of what I, what I said. Uh, so at low levels, pro-social incentive scheme seems to work best. The next um, question that we wanted to ask was whether people would actually understand this and when they were asked, who do you want to work for? Do you want to work for charity or do you want to work for yourself? Given the incentive level, would they choose the incentive level according to the graph that I put forward? So again, we had these students, same setup, a uh, different group of students, same setup as experiment one, they were asked, uh, okay, here's how much you're gonna get paid for this unit of effort, do you wanna work for charity, do you wanna work for yourself? And uh, the prediction was that at the low amounts, people wanted to work for charity, that would, would make them happier. At the high amounts, they would switch, they would wanna work for themselves and get their money themselves. And that's exactly it. So here's the choice, at the low incentive levels, they chose to work for charity, they, they thought that, that would make them happier, and at the high incentives, uh, it flipped, individuals wanted to work for themselves and get the money themselves. So here's that data, uh, a little bit, a little hint of statistics that all of this stuff is significant. Um, and basically 77% of people chose to work for others at the low incentive levels, and only 15% of people wanted to work for the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, when the incentives were so what are the implications? As a firm, if you don't have a lot of money to spend on a project, pro-social incentive schemes are a great way to go. They're gonna uh, get your employees to put in more effort, your workforce is gonna be happier, and the choice is consistent with behavior, meaning that the employees understand this. And as a charity contacting an employer, that's, those are exactly the types of situations that you should be looking for. And, um, and again, this creates positive external externalities for the firm because uh, they have a happier workforce and a better uh, company image. So the next question that we wanted to address was there's number one, again, we used the student population in a very artificial environment, namely the lab. There was experimenter demand effect. They knew that they were part of an experiment. Uh, and so we wanted to see uh, how people would react to these sorts of incentive schemes when they didn't know that they were being studied. The other question that we wanted to know is that, okay, so you have this pro-social incentive scheme, there's a decent amount of academic work saying that if you put a person in a pro-social incentive scheme, they're gonna work pretty hard, but they're gonna cross the street when they know about it next day. So that's the, the famous story uh, of the Salvation Army, uh, the person <laughs> ringing the bell. If the person is confronted by him, he's ringing the bell, he asks for some money, the individual takes it out of his pocket, he gives it to him, but if he sees him a block away, he'll look, look down and cross the street and avoid it. So it's the same thing gonna happen with pro-social incentive schemes. If a firm decides to implement a pro-social incentive scheme, are people just not gonna work for that firm? So if they were forced to work for their firm, they might work harder, but are they gonna avoid it? And the second question we wanted to ask was whether making the choice and the effort uh, of working for charity public so that everybody else in the room would know, would that have an effect? Would that increase uh, the effectiveness of this sort of incentive scheme? So again, so field experiment people would probably not view this as a field experiment. Uh, I didn't go to a developing country. Um, I actually just, uh, I ran this at UCSD as well with my colleagues. But the, the key is what uh, in some ways makes it more field experiment-esque is the fact that the participants didn't know that they were being part of an experiment. So what we did was we organized a recycling drive on the campus. So if you know the campus at all, it's divided into colleges, so there's uh, five different colleges. Each college basically has its own economics class, its own literature class. So you can go to a college and randomize by college so that you don't, uh, so you're basically getting the same exact setting, and the only thing that's being, uh, being changed is the treatment. So what we did was we organized the recycling drive because recycling is exactly one of those things where individuals are being paid relatively little money for something that is somewhat effort. So they're only getting five cents, 
for collecting uh, for the collecting their garbage basically in a different bin, taking it to some recycling center, so on and so forth. So we used five cents, that's the standard incentive scheme that's used in the United States, and money either went to, the, to them or to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And what we did was we wanted to sign people up for this recycling campaign. So uh, in order to create awareness of this, we went into classrooms and we handed out slips of paper, and on the slip of, slip of paper, you can indicate, put your email down and say, look, I want to participate in this recycling campaign. We're going to email you on the day of it, and you're going to come and bring in your recycling. And that was the opt-in. That's saying, if you put your email down, that's saying, I want to be a part of this recycling campaign. And then you were contacted, and so on and so forth. So sometimes the incentive was for charity. Sometimes the incentive was for yourself. You got five cents going to you, five cents going to the Make-A-Wish Foundation per unit of recycling that you brought. And sometimes, in one, in one condition, the public condition, you raised your hand if you opted in. So at the end of the class, when you were supposed to hand in these sheets of paper, you raised your hand for the experiment, for the research assistant or whoever to collect your sheets, or you just basically put it in an envelope and passed it along to the side. And then we had a control where there was no payment for the recycling, it was just bringing in your recycling to this. So we predicted that, unlike the research uh, up uh, to that point, that in fact, the op along the opt-in margin pro-social incentive schemes will still be more effective than standard ones, and the effect will be greater in public. And here are our results. This is the opt-in. So as you can see, the opt-in likelihood for the standard, sorry, selfish man, man, not selfish, it's just standard incentive scheme. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not selfish to bring recycling. Uh, uh, but the, the opt-in is pretty low, it's below 10%, right? So regardless if it's in public or private, under 10% of people are opting into this recycling uh, scheme and showing up. But if it's pro-social and in public, that increases to 23% opt-in. 23% of people said, look, send me an email, I want to come to your recycling drive and bring in my class. In private, it was 15%, still significantly higher than in any of the standard treatments. So the main effect of the pro-social incentive scheme is that 19.1% of people in the pro-social incentive scheme opted in, wanted to be participate, whereas when the money went to them, only 7.4%. And you had significantly more uh, people in the public treatment only had an effect in the pro-social incentive scheme. So whether it was in public or private, when the money went to you, it didn't affect how often, uh, to what extent you wanted to opt in, but if the money went to charity and you can signal that, look, I'm a good guy, I'm going to be uh, participating in this recycling scheme, that significantly increased the opt-in percentage. So the last experiment that I'm going to be talking about in this framework, we used Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is an online labor market. It's a spot market. So as a firm, you put it on the task, and it's kind of like crowd, crowdfunding or crowdsourcing. You have people, uh, a, a, an online group of people, uh, agree to do your task. One person agrees. You pay them over the Amazon Mechanical Turk system, and you get uh, their average. So here, you put down a task of it for individuals to collect uh, wildlife images for a database, and the effort was how many wildlife images they actually went through and sifted through the internet to give us the links to. And here the bonus was either low or high. So the low amount was one cent per 10 images, the high was 10 cents per 10 images, and the beneficiary was either the, uh, a charitable foundation or the individual himself. And everybody got a show of the, everybody got a bonus. So our, again, our um, dependent variable was how many people after seeing the incentive scheme, as in they clicked on the link for this task, and then they were exposed to the incentive scheme, how many then went on to actually do the task? So what we found was a very similar effect to the, to the one that I showed you earlier in the lab. Uh, so what you see is that the pro-social incentive scheme actually worked better, uh, largely worked better across both incentives levels on average, but it particularly worked better at the low incentive levels. So, they're finishing the task around 63% of the time on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So this is a selected sample, but it's in some ways different than the student sample because all of these, these people are earning very little money. And so 
they're completely motivated by standard incentives. And still, even in this marketplace, pro-social incentives are working better than standard ones. And that effect is somewhat attenuated as you increase the size of the incentive. So what this suggests is, from this series of experiments, is that conditional on being in, in a pro-social incentive scheme, you work harder when the stakes are low, and even not conditional on being in it, individuals are choosing to be in it when the stakes are low, particularly when that decision can be done in public. So uh, that's kind of the takeaway there. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about, another sequence of uh, experiments, and I'll see how far I can get to in the time.